uh, I know it's like that here, but. <laughs> so, um, I, I have a few things that I'm doing with the industry, and none of it relates to anything I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it's customary at a, at a um, when you go to give a talk like this that you you, know, you show a, a picture of your medical center, you know, and the and the idea behind this, I think, is that you know if you have good buildings and all that stuff, you know, that probably all the doctors and programs are good, and um, and so here's the obligate slide like that, and this is our hospital here. Um, um, Basically, yeah, this is the main part of the hospital, the children's hospital, and all the rest of this stuff. Now, here I know it's different. Uh, I know it's it's kind of a you take a different approach. What they do here is is that if if the chairman looks good, then probably you know probably the, the you know the, the department's good. And so I, I know it's different, you know, in that respect here. <clears throat> But I was when I was looking at these pictures, I just got this kind of queasy feeling in my stomach, and I, I was wondering if they, <laughs> did, did, did they, you know, do they pass out the Zofran when you have to look at all this stuff? Yeah. So hopefully you'll let me know about this later. Um, well, no, you know, it's really uh, a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm going to give the, the Tyndall lecture later on tonight, and it, and it really is. Uh, a great honor, and it's a great joy for me to for me and my wife Corinne to visit Dan and Molly. And, and uh, as you all know, I have I think the world of this place and of Dan, and um, I have had uh, the good fortune of having several of the best people that I've trained, including uh, John Willie and Matt Reynolds and Dan Rafai, join the faculty here under your Dan, your your tutelage and it's been great. They're all and it's so wonderful. I saw them last night. They're all thriving and uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I it's it's really terrific here at, at Emory. And um, what I'm gonna speak about this morning <clears throat> is basically some intraoperative decision making be the be clipping of the aneurysms. And then in the second half of the thing I'm going to talk about decision making regarding colloid cysts and when we should operate on them and how we should operate on them. So two kind of diverse things, but um, the thing that I, one of the things that I'm interested in, and I know Dan's interested in this, is how do people learn to become neurosurgeons and how do they uh, develop the de decision making skills, both intraoperative and, and extraoperative, to, um, to do what we do. And uh, I think it's a very important thing for us to think about because, hey, Rusty, hey, Rusty. I think it's an important thing for us all to think about because um, it's really what we do and um, as, as educators. And, and I, I think we don't spend enough time on really understanding this. So what we're going to talk about is, is that, again, in the context of clip constructs for middle cerebral artery aneurysms, and then determining which patients with colloid cysts should receive surgical treatment. So, as you all know, and uh, I see Dr. Colley over there, and I'm sure he, he he would agree with this, that you know we are doing much much more for patients with intracranial aneurysms, and we're doing it much better. But uh, there's a, been a decrease relatively in the number of patients that undergo clipping procedures especially relative to the um, total number of cases that we're, that we're doing. Um, but we have to preserve excellence in the microsurgical treatment of aneurysms and in other aspects of microsurgery. Um, and so when I was thinking about this with, with one of my uh, residents um, who's now an attending, Chad Washington, we were thinking about whether there's a role for pattern recognition in determining the principles of aneurysm shape analysis and its effect on clip selection strategy. Now, the reason I think this is important is that in the past, guys like, like these people have developed huge cumulative experience 
in, in, in doing aneurysm surgery. And uh, all these guys are giants, except for Dan, who's about my height. <laughs> and, um, but no, literally, they all, they all are. But you know, the problem is accruing this degree of cumulative experience takes thousands of aneurysms and tens of thousands of hours. So, um, so how can we, is there a way we can maybe shortcut that and, and kind of use the experiences that other people have had to inculcate approaches vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, pattern recognition. And so the, the, what we're going to talk about here is the fact that I think pattern recognition and shape analysis is important, and that a relatively small number of patterns explain the variability, especially at the MCA site in terms of, of aneurysm shape, but also probably uh, at most of the other sites too. And that the shape pattern of the aneurysm determines the optimal clip solution. Um, so pattern recognition, you can think about it in different ways. Obviously, in the, in the context of this, a visual cue is presented. The visual cue then triggers, triggers an association based on the person's cumulative experience. And then that person formulates the concept of a solution to the problem. So this is uh, something that was learned in Afghanistan. Um, the people over there quickly learned when they saw something like this, it looks like an innocent pile of trash, that it, you know, it may not be. And so uh, uh, here's this little tire here by the side of the road, and these soldiers are trying to deal with this. And, and they very rapidly figured out that that's what's happening in Afghanistan. And based on that pattern recognition, um, they were able to significantly mitigate the IED threat uh, um, there. And um, so we, in the context of this, we conducted an analysis of a randomly selected group of our middle cerebral artery aneurysms, um, about 60 of them. And what we did is we first visually sorted the aneurysms and identified clusters of shape patterns and then identified four common shape patterns, which we think accurately describe the, the uh, shape of most of these aneurysms in the majority of, of the aneurysms at the middle cerebral site. So here were the 60 aneurysms, and we looked at them and then said, well, this one's like this one, and this one's not like this one, and et cetera. And we sorted them uh, into these various categories, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute here. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then in the second part of this, I'm going to tell you how we de develop what we think is an automated way to do some of this, uh, pattern recognition with some computer, um, science techniques. So anyway, this first shape looks like this. And basically this is a shape where, um, the main part of the, the aneurysm comes off at the distal part of the M1 segment. And, there, and one of the two branches is smaller than the other branch. Um, and in this case, there, there usually is a side branching of the, uh, of the main part of the fundus of the aneurysm. And so, you know, here, here you can see, you know, small branch, bigger branch, Side, bran side branching aneurysm, small branch, bigger branch, et cetera. They're all pretty much the same. And the optimal clip solution for this thing is very simple. Either a straight or, or gentle curved clip goes on parallel to the large M2 branch, and you spare the, uh, the, um, the little branch, obviously. So here's an example of an aneurysm like that. There's the aneurysm. Here's the large <laughs> branch. Here's the small branch down here. Clip goes on like that. Completely simple. Okay. The second shape category looks like this. It's kind of a T. And basically, the, the aneurysm comes off like a basilar bifurcation aneurysm at the end of the T, and that the angle um, of uh, alignment of the two M2 branches are kind of an acute angle, less than 90 degrees. 
And um, so here are, the, here are some of these aneurysms. They're all pretty much the same. The size bit varies a little bit, but they're all pretty much you know, the same in terms of that basic anatomy. So the optimal clip solution for this kind of aneurysm <clears throat> is um, usually a right angle or a variable angle clip that goes on parallel to the conduit between the two uh, M2 divisions, okay? And here's an example of any couple of aneurysms like that. So same, you know, right angle clip. Here's the, you know, M1, M2 over here, another one over here. Here's another one. Um, and the, the other the two M2s are at the bottom of this right angle clip. And here's, here's one here. And preserving that conduit between the two divisions here. The third shape cluster that we identified looked like this. <clears throat> and the characteristics of these aneurysms was, again, the thing comes off as a, at a T with an acute angle between the two branches. But the <clears throat> long axis of the aneurysm occurred perpendicular to the axis between the two M2 divisions. And this, the recognition of this shape is important because the clip solution for this is a little bit different. Um, a shank clip where the bayoneted portion of the clip goes over one part of the aneurysm and the tips of the clip occlude the rest of it um, is often a very good strategy. And this approach was uh, uh, initially described by a good friend of Dan and mine, uh, Shiga Kobayashi, um, in the 90s, uh, and, and, he, and he called that a shank clipping. So here's, a, here's an aneurysm that looks like this, a type 3 aneurysm. The shank or the bayonet portion of the clip gets that part. The tips get this part, and it can be a good way. Here's another one, a couple of different lobules of this aneurysm. The shank gets, gets this part, the tips get that part. And, um, and, and this is a nice way to take care of all of the aneurysm here um, with, with one clip construct. <clears throat> and um, a kind of an extreme form of this is one of these aneurysms where the two lobes are coming off um, very much uh, uh, at angles to an, uh, another one. And the way you, you take care of it is by using a straight and a fenestrated clip um, placed at a real steep angle, like a steeple roof, um, to uh, clip the aneurysm uh, like this. So that's kind of a, a, an extreme version of that. Now, why does this matter? Well, I mean, if you don't get the right clip, on the, on the right shape of aneurysm, then you have an incompatibility between the, the clip solution and the shape. So here's this one, this curved clip leaves a lot of the, of the bottom of, of this uh, uh, aneurysm and, and you know, it's not the right solution. Similarly, if on this type three aneurysm, the a right angle clip is placed and the jaws are forced down on the, on the branch, then you're gonna occlude the branch. So, you know, pretty simple, but, but there is a, you know, the, the clip solution obviously has to fit the shape of the aneurysm. Now, a somewhat more complicated shape category is this type four aneurysm here, where here you get, have a, an aneurysm that arises at the end of a T, but the angle that, of the takeoff of the M2 branches relative to the M1 is, at a, a, a much more obtuse angle, greater than, much greater than 90 degrees. So here's some aneurysms that look like this. They're all pretty, a di little different shape, but, but you know, basically it looks, looks like this. These aneurysms need to be treated, in my experience, with temporary clips almost always. And then you need to uh, decompress the fundus of this large aneurysm or relatively large aneurysm and place a right angle or angled clip 
um, parallel to that um, connection between the two divisions so that you preserve it. And the clip needs to be high enough on the fundus so that you don't crimp the uh, branches. So here's an aneurysm, a couple of aneurysms like that. Here are these branches over here in the sylvian fissure. Temporary clips on, uh, aspirate the fundus, place the um, angled clip like that. Little, boot, little tandem clip because it's got some athenoma in it. And um, here's another one similar. These two, all the branches coming down here, temporary clips all lined up next to each other in the Sylvian fissure, right angle clip down here, leaving enough of this thick atheromatous base to make sure that you don't crimp the thing. So, and a critical thing here is when you put that clip on there, if the, if the thickness of the wall is too much, it's very, very easy to have the branch occluded. And you got to make sure that you don't put the clip down too low on the fundus like this, especially with a thick wall of aneurysm. And of course, this is why ICG and other forms of intraoperative angiography are very important when you put these clips on to make sure all these branches are filling, especially with an aneurysm like this. So when we went back and looked at the breakdown of the shape pattern categories, about 18% were type 1. Type 2 is the most common, 43%. Uh, a few of these kind of unusual category 3 shapes, where we noted them. These are the ones for the shank clip. And then a, a pretty a relatively uh, um, a frequent occurrence of this category 4 aneurysms that are a little bit more complicated. Now, what we were interested in is trying to model this cognitive process, and we're still working on this. Chad Washington and I and, and the computer guys are working on this. Um, but we wanted to use the rules we developed in the visual characterization of the shapes and then try to automate the pattern recognition um, using three-dimensional angiograms. And then um, use machine learning, large image data sets, and facial recognition software principles to, uh, to recognize the individual characteristics. And you know, this, the science behind this has been put forward a lot by the whole, you know, Homeland Security and all that stuff, trying to recognize faces. And, and there's been incredible uh, <coughs> progress made on this. And we wanted to kind of um, see if we could apply this to aneurysm shape recognition. And so basically, this is just a schematic uh, to show you how our computer scientists looked at the shape and then and broke it down into first recognizing the outlines of the complex shape on the three-dimensional angiograms in terms of you know, the edges that have to be detected then determining what the major angles were between the various elements, recognizing that the shapes are, can be recognized so that, you know, you know that this shape is tubular, so it's a vessel. This shape is non-tubular, so it's an aneurysm. And that, so that the program had to recognize that. And then these various angles that I, I mentioned are then measured by the program, including these angles about the planes of the major projections of the various parts of the aneurysm. And, and then we um, made an algorithm where the five aspects of these descriptors of the aneurysm are processed mathematically um, and the mathematical prediction then gives us a probability that the shape we're looking at fits into our category here. Now, I could explain all this math to you and everything, and, but I'm, Dan would be embarrassed because he wouldn't understand. It. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to go into the details on that with you. But, but trust me that uh, we've got some really good computer scientists working on this. And, and what, we, what we determined 
um, was that, for example, for category three, we were able to predict this um, almost 90% of the time uh, in these aneurysms based just on the computer algorithm analyzing the shape. It was harder a little bit with the type twos, and we're still working on that, and, and this is just a work in progress. So to summarize this part of the talk, pattern recognition is, an, is important, I think, in aneurysm microsurgery, and I think every experienced aneurysm surgeon will tell you that. Um, and, you know, I am interested, and I know a lot of other people are interested in trying to um, extend that common pattern recognition process that we do and try to dissect it and see if we can uh, uh, predict what kinds of shapes are best to do with what kind of aneurysm. Um, eventually, using you know things like 3D printers and, and a lot of the other incredible computer techniques, I, I think it's going to be likely that we're going to be doing this kind of thing in the future for a lot of different microsurgical applications, and, and we're beginning to work on that. And Chad Washington, who's um, now at the University of Mississippi on the faculty, and Tao Zhu, who's a computer science guy, wizard kind of guy, helped me do this, and, uh, and uh, it's been fun, and we're continuing to work on it. Chad has a, a stable of about 2,000 um, 3D angiograms that, we've, that we're looking at for, for um, to try at other locations to try to see if we can um, take this further. And we're going to do it, actually, we're going to include the, the endovascular solutions that are that have been done on these aneurysms, too, to try and see if we can figure that out. Um, now, I'm going to shift gears here now for the rest of the half of the talk um, and talk a little bit about non-surgical decision-making, in other words, extra-operative surgical decision-making. Um, and uh, one of my residents, um, Tom Beaumont, did, did most of this work uh, with me. Um, and, we, and we looked at the natural history of colloid cysts in the third ventricle in an effort to try to determine which of the many patients that we see with colloid cysts, many that are identified incidentally, should we treat? Um, and, and I think most of you know that uh, colloid cysts of the third ventricle are relatively unusual intracranial tumors. Um, in the incidence is about three per million in the United States and in Europe. They are benign mucin-filled mass, masses in the roof of the third ventricle at the foramen of Monroe. Um, they are thought to be remnants of the paraphysis, um, which, which is an outpouching of uh, one of the primitive vesicles of the brain in the formation of the septum pellucid. Um, I know a lot about the paraphysis, and I'm not going to tell you um, anything more about it because um, then, you know, Dan, for example, would know as much about it as I do. <laughs> so, um, but uh, seriously, that's about, that's about as much as anybody knows about the paraphernalia. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, people, people talk about it in every talk on calling cysts. Um, you know, most of these things probably have a um, indolent clinical course. But they can cause hydrocephalus and acute deterioration and death. And so we were interested in trying to figure out, you know, how often does that occur? The risk of sudden death has been quoted as being um, as much as 12% for symptomatic patients. And if the patient presents in a coma or with a rapid neurological deterioration, they will, most, they will very frequently die. So um, it, it's been a problem. Now, the Mayo Clinic studies that were done in the 80s and 90s had until recently formed the, the total amount of information we had on these things. Um, but I think it's clear that the optimal management strategy and surgical indications are poorly defined for colloid cysts. And it's increasingly important because there are many, many more incidentally identified lesions now 
And I think you can think about the, 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 the issues here in two ways. I think we all know that symptomatic colloid cyst should be retreated, uh, should be treated, or in some cases treated with a shunt possibly. But the two um, things that are now out there in the literature are kind of a, uh, a one, you know, is in conflict with the other. The people at Cornell have said that there's a low but significant r risks for colloid cysts that are incidentally identified, and therefore all of these things should be resected. The other approach is that the risk is low for incidental colloid cysts, and most of them can be followed carefully um, to determine if symptoms develop. And so we were kind of interested in getting at that with a view to answering these questions. How should we counsel patients with colloid cysts about their natural history? Do all colloid cysts have a similar natural history? To whom should we offer surgery? And what surgical approaches you know, are, are best in terms of safety and efficacy? And you know, the questions around this are kind of you know, epitomized by these two patients. So on the one hand, we got a 24-year-old woman with headache, nausea, and vomiting. And uh, she has a seven millimeter cyst uh, in this location in the, in, in the ventricle, and we'll talk about that in a minute, versus a 71-year-old woman who's found to have this seven millimeter cyst incidentally. So what do we do with those two patients? Do, they, do we treat them the same? <clears throat> We looked at 163 of, of, uh, of the patients that we had treated at Wash U um, in the past um, approximately 20 years. Uh, and we you know, queried the databases that we have in radiology and in our department. We reviewed the histology, pathology, and the neuroimaging. And we compiled the data on all of these patients and did some some uh, uh, kind of typical uh, statistical analysis. So there are 174 cases that we identified. 11 were excluded because um, we had either questionable imaging or the path was not convincing. Um, of these 163, 40% were symptomatic and 60% were incidental lesions. Now, <clears throat> The problem with everything about colloid, trying to study colloid cysts is that it's a rare, a relatively unusual condition. And you have to look at a diverse group of patients to determine, um, you know, how, how do you make inferences about how the, you know, we should manage patients based on looking at a combination of patients that are either symptomatic or incidental have hydrocephalus, don't have hydrocephalus, had surgery, don't have surgery. In other words, comparing and contrasting all these various groups um, is useful in terms of getting insights into which patients are at the highest risk. Now, you'll notice in this part of the talk that sometimes this thing has a mind, this, this, this talk has a mind of its own and it, it advances to the next set of, you know, prompts, you know, and this is where my, my uh, resident, Tom Beaumont, who put a lot of this together in terms of the automation, kind of gets carried away with himself. And you'll see, so if this thing, if this talk sort of like goes berserk or something, you'll understand, you know, why that's happening. Anyway, let's compare symptomatic and incidental patients, one to the other. Symptomatic patients are more likely to be younger than older, um, they're more like they they are more likely to have larger cysts, and um, the the cyst cutoff um, of around seven millimeters is important here, and we'll come back to that. We also looked at cyst volume, the Evans ratio, which you know for the medical students here, if, if the Evans ratio is is greater than three. It means that the measurement of the of the ventricular uh, size at the level of the foramen of Monroe uh, is relatively large compared to the um, um, 
intercalvarial distance at that level. So if it's 0.3 or more, it's, it's hydrocephalus. Um, so it's just an indicator of hydrocephalus. Um, the symptomatic patients obviously more likely to have headache, um, more likely to have hydrocephalus, more likely to have acute hydrocephalus, and we'll come back to this. We also found in, in the Mayo Clinic studies there was the idea that if the if the in, if the uh, increased signal on T two was noted, that that was a risk factor. <clears throat> We didn't find that, but we did find that the increased flare signal was definitely a risk factor, and we'll come back to that. So here's, a, here's a, an increased uh, flare intensity, and that's a definite risk factor. And then we'll talk a little bit about the anatomic risk zone. Hey, Ralph, just, yeah. Just to clarify one thing. So the patient was considered to be in the center of the Obviously, there are patients that have headache that don't have hydrocephalus, how did you determine that the headache right. was, the, was caused by the cyst? Good question. What we did was, in deciding between those two groups, is if, if they didn't have hydrocephalus um, and, and no other neurological symptoms or findings, we attributed them to the incidental group because obviously many, many patients have headaches. And not all of them are due to the colloid cyst. Does that answer your question? Well, that is, I understand how you pick the incidentals, but, but if, only, if only half the patients had hydrocephalus in your symptomatic group, what were their symptoms? I mean, how else does a colloid cyst cause symptoms other than uh, hydrocephalus? Well, was it memory loss from porosteal compression? Yeah, or? I'll come back to that okay. in, in, in one of the stuff. I get the incidental group. I'm just curious about how you. Defined symptomatic. Yeah, yeah. Without yeah. And that was, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, the, the, so, the, again, to emphasize factors for symptom that, that separated the symptomatic from the incidental younger, headache, cyst diameter more than seven, hydrocephalus, hyperintensity on flare signal. Now, the incidental patients. Um, the, there, there, you know, this was about 60% of them, um, 8% of them progressed during the period of time that we observed them. Uh, one patient was, was noted to have died and was lost to follow up. And we, we interrogated one of these death. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, databases, um, and, and we identified this patient in the database, lost a follow-up, died, so we don't know what happened to that patient. But no other patient among this 8% died as a result of having progression or acute deterioration, and we'll get back to that. Um, so we did have some patients to get to, to, to uh, Dan's point who had um, either developed headaches later after we had initially identified them as, as incidental, had cognitive decline, or, or in a couple of cases um, that, I, that I'll talk about, um, had some other symptoms. So um, again, the incidental patients were, were uh, uh, or, the, or the, the, the incidental patients were, were less likely to be younger present with headache and head flare hyperintensity. Um, a couple of patients, Dan, were evaluated for bradycardia. Um, and we had a couple of, of patients who actually pretty legitimately had bradycardia that we treated and were and it resolved. So we attributed that. Had a couple of people who had syncope, cognitive decline, vision changes that were unassociated with headache. So we had some, some other patients that had different symptoms. Um, of the patients uh, who were symptomatic, about 46% of them only had hydrocephalus. Of those, eight had acute, the development of acute hydrocephalus, and that's an important group of patients we'll talk about. So, Again, another way of looking at this is 
what were the patients that had hydrocephalus versus the other patients, and how were they different one from the other? Well, the, the patients with hydrocephalus also tended to be younger. They also um, had uh, cyst diameters that were larger, higher cyst volumes, and of course had uh, an Evans ratio. And the, uh, the T2-weighted signal was also an important risk factor there. They were obviously more likely to have, have surgery. So again, looking at the hydrocephalus question, younger, headache, larger cysts, and hyperintensity on flare signals were all, all risks that were associated here. Now, we, we looked at also, was there a difference between um, uh, cyst diameter and cyst volume? And it's interesting to know that, note that, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because <clears throat> none of the patients who, di who um, had hydrocephalus present had cysts that were smaller than, than seven millimeters, as, a, as, a, as opposed to the patients where the hydrocephalus was absent. Um, and um, it was also clear that the, that the risk uh, of having hydrocephalus was clearly related to cyst diameter across the spectrum. So what was, the, what was the relationship between hydrocephalus and cyst volume? So here's volume here versus cyst uh, diameter. And if you blow that up, you, you uh, find that there's a distribution across, especially the high cyst volumes and high cyst diameters. And, and volume clearly varied within a given axial diameter. It was interesting that some of the largest volume cysts, like this one, did not produce hydrocephalus and were not symptomatic. And it had to do with how the cyst grew. Whereas cysts that grew like this down into the ventricle and were smaller were more likely to become symptomatic and develop hydrocephalus. <clears throat> but, but cyst volume clearly was related to the risk um, of, of developing hydrocephalus. Now, this flare signal thing was interesting. As you know, <clears throat> the flare thing is basically just an optimized T2 image where the, the cutoff for the hyperintensity is set at the level of about CSF. So if you have protein or lots of cells or pus, then the, the flare signal is going to be higher in that uh, cystic lesion. And when, you, and when you look at either hypo intensity, iso intensity, or hyper intensity on the flare sequence, it was much more likely to be associated with hydrocephalus <laughs> if, the, um, if the flare uh, was hyper intense. What we don't know is <coughs> of the patients who initially did not have hydrocephalus, was flare hyperintensity a risk factor for shifting into this symptomatic and hydrocephalus group? And we're still trying to work that out. We're going to have to do that with a larger database on this thing. Now, we also came up with this concept of a colloid cyst of the third ventricle anatomic risk zone. And so there are three zones that we identified. One is from the, from the lamina term analysis to the uh, anterior part of the mass intermedia then from mass intermedia to the uh, uh, beginning of the aqueduct, and then beyond, behind that. So when we looked at these anatomic risk zones, we found that there were most of the lesions were in zone one. Um, there were some in zone two, and then a very few were in zone three. But zone one and zone three were high-risk zones. So here's an, a, an unusual patient that we saw who presented with um, rapid deterioration over about 12 hours and came in with hydrocephalus. 
And we found that the, the cyst was here at the entrance of the aqueduct here, kind of an unusual location. And you know, you, you wonder, people are, like on those TV programs about, what is it, um, you know, about where they have all those handsome doctors that all look like men. <clears throat> TV, like, uh, yeah, Grey's Anatomy, yeah. So what they'll always be talking about, did the cyst move and cause a problem? But I think in this case, that actually did happen. It's a very rare situation, but it probably detached from its location in zone one and went down into, into zone three here. And there's, an, there's one other case report in the pediatric literature of this happening. So can we come up with a simple clinical tool that allows us to um, I don't know what's wrong with this thing, to get the risk for these patients. So it says on here it says Microsoft PowerPoint has stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell that. By, by this situation, so I don't know what the hell to do here. Um, <coughs> um, I don't know. Just I don't know. I've never seen that. So what we developed was this thing called a colloid cyst risk score, okay? So this is a pretty simple thing where we look at age, presence of headache, diameter more than seven millimeters, flare, hyperintensity, yes or no, and the risk zone. And we give them either a zero or a one for a, for a score that ranges between the total zero and five. So here's the, here's the uh, flare hyperintensity, here's the risk zone. Um, and and um, when we looked at, the relationship between the score and whether or not the patients were symptomatic, there was a clear-cut um, relationship. Similarly, no patient with scores of one or two developed hydrocephalus. Three was uh, intermediate, and then four and five had a higher risk of uh, developing hydrocephalus. And when you looked at the receiver-operator curves, for this in terms of a, a test that would be effective for discriminating between um, a, a, a symptomatic patient and an asymptomatic patient or a patient who had hydrocephalus, the area under the curve is, uh, approaches 90%, which is, which is pretty good. Um, and um, so we think that these you know, probably are going to be effective means of discriminating between the two. So the range of scores between zero to five, less than two is low risk, three intermediate, four to five, high risk, and surgery is probably indicated. So going back to these cases that we talked about initially, this 24-year-old woman with a seven millimeter cyst has, a, versus this 71-year-old lady with a seven millimeter cyst, hers is in zone two, there's flare piper intensity in zone one for her. So her college cyst um, uh, severity score or risk score is five, whereas this lady's is one. And this, you know, is some, a patient that should, probably should be treated. Indeed, this patient subsequently, two years later, presented with hydrocephalus and, uh, and transependable absorption here. And uh, she ended up undergoing uh, surgery. So based on the natural history, I think we can 
conclude that both enlargement and symptomatic progression of colloid cysts can occur. It's about 8% for regression. Death due to progression is rare, but it can occur. Nearly a half of the symptomatic patients presented with obstructive hydrocephalus. And we think that this colloid cyst risk score is potentially a simple and effective clinical tool. Um, and that surgical intervention should, intervention should be considered for patients with scores greater than four. So getting back to these questions that we posed down at the bottom here, what surgical approach optimizes efficacy and safety and resource utilization? Now, since um, the time of Dandy and Cushing, approaches to colloid cysts uh, were, were made usually through um, the ventricle or an interhemispheric approach. And um, here is, is a nice um, depiction from Roten indicating the, the interhemispheric uh, approach um, then through the ventricle to the foramen and row. And here's the cyst being aspirated and, and mobilized and resected. Here's the fornix, here's the anterior part of the thalamus here. And this can be an effective, obviously is a very effective way of treating these lesions. Here's the opening into the ventricle here. And we just gradually um, whittle this thing down and, and uh, remove it. The endoscopic approach has also been advocated and, and in a number of uh, uh, studies that have been presented recently from the United States and Europe, good results have been reported with a completely endoscopic approach. Most recently, the, the, um, the uh, report from Cornell <clears throat> um, indicates a, a very uh, a favorable set of outcomes here with a uh, low risk of complications. <clears throat> and you know, in the Cornell paper, there's an, an interesting discussion of the natural history presented from a population-based standard uh, in the Dutch study and the Finnish study where they have a, a lot of control over what happens to their patients over years. And cumulatively, the risk that was projected in both of these studies for um, sudden death or neurological deterioration was pretty high, similar to an arteriovenous malformation. So this led them to recommend that based on the low risk of complications for endoscopic resection and the cumulative lifetime risk between 10 and 40 percent, that they recommended endoscopic resection of all incidentally discovered colloid cysts. So, so what's the best way to do this? I mean, we, we've recently developed some experience with the endoscopic approach, and it's, it's a very nice way to do it. Um, the pediatric surgeons are, you know, kind of leaders on using these techniques um, to resect interventricular lesions. And, I, and I've really become a, um, a believer in, in this technique. Here we are resecting the cyst context with, contents with the, this NICO. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very nice way to do it. Obviously, stereotactic guidance is used to get into the appropriate orientation of the ventricle. And there's a nice resection. Here's another one. Um, <clears throat> the uh, image guidance is important. We make more of a lateral entry to the ventricle um, and uh, use this <clears throat> Bugby device to coagulate both the choroid plexus and the wall of the uh, lesion. And you know, if it starts to bleed, you know, you just irrigate it and usually it stops It's pretty good. We haven't had to convert any of these to um, open procedures. Here we are just uh, cutting into the capsule and then evacuating it with this Nico Myriad. And then um, here's the remainder of the cyst contents. 
And then we usually just do a septostomy at the end so that we can, if there's a problem with ventricular obstruction, it can be handled uh, um, more easily if the ventricles communicate. So um, we found in, in our relatively small group of patients that we've treated with this that the risks are um, higher with the open approach. And we're pretty impressed that the endoscopic approach is pretty safe. And the um, uh, and this is actually is, is interesting because it mirrors the approach of the, the um, um, outcomes at the barrow, where they reported a higher risk with the open approach there, too. The costs are much less for the endoscopic approach compared to the open approach. And, uh, and you know, so we, we think it's a promising uh, development, and I, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see how you guys manage these lesions here in terms of endoscopic versus open. But in conclusion, I think um, to just go back, we, we made the observations about the, uh, the natural history. We think that surgical intervention be, should be considered for everybody that has a colloid cyst risk score of greater than four, and we think that endoscopic resection is going to prove to give um, more safety, shorter hospital stays, and, and uh, improved uh, outcomes. So with that, I'll stop, and we're just about on time. I'd be interested in your approach to college cysts here, Dan, and um, I really appreciate the honor of being invited to give the lecture this year, and thanks very much for having me. How how do you do your colloid cyst here? Both ways. Both ways. I mean, yeah. And so <clears throat> majority did you transposal, but not also did it from the way it's stopping these Yeah. Yeah. So the patient that you identified in the incidental group that ultimately Appear again in death records. Do you happen to know where they would have fallen on that CCR or CCR score? They, uh, that person was a three. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, our approach to these patients now, and I'd be interested to see what the neurosurgeons here think. But our approach to these patients is here that if they have the uh, you know a high risk, then we just do them. But we do, we do, for people who are one and two, we follow a lot of them. And I think, the, and, I, and I've been in, in one place long enough now to know that the risk of them deteriorating is about 10%, as we said. And, um, and, and most patients are going to do pretty well with a, with a conservative approach. So I kind of I disagree with the approach that the Cornell guys have put out there that if you find one, they have to be resected. I, I don't think that's right. Yeah, John. Um, so when I have <clears throat> trouble making decisions on these patients, I, I do make the decision just make a sound approach. But um, it's been the patient that has a good story, sounds symptomatic, but there's no imaging whatsoever other than the fact that it's five, six, seven millimeters. No T2 change, there's no flare change. Those are the ones that are hard to decide on. They may have a headache, maybe it's a morning headache, or even it sounds pretty convincing story, but there's just no imaging corroboration and the metrics are small. Yeah. Where do those patients tend to fit? Well, most of them are in that intermediate class there for that because you know they don't have hydrocephalus. And that's tough. I had a guy come to see me about six months ago and he said, you know, I just don't feel right and I got a scan and it showed this colloid cysk and, you know, I just, you know, I feel, do you have a headache? No, I don't really have a headache. I, some, I feel like I have a hangover, you know, and, and he said, do you, do you know what that feeling is like? Said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and then his wife, it was amazing, I'll never forget this. His wife said, yeah, and you know what's really weird? He'll wake up and he feels like he's got this hangover. And then 
if he would sneeze, the thing would go, that would go away and he'd feel much better. I said, geez, that doesn't sound good. So, so with this guy, even though he had a risk score of three, he did have a high signal on the, on the flare, but it was like eight millimeters or something. And we did him and he, the symptoms totally went away. So, I mean, I think you got to really, you got to really agonize about that kind of a history. If there's any positional aspect of it, yeah. It could possibly relate to something that I've come across in one of the patients that have been physical since it's apparent sleep apnea. Have you seen that? Because it also relates to what you said, because most people actually have true sleep apnea, wake up, and they have no idea. Yeah. I have, that's an interesting, I have, we haven't looked at that. We probably, we probably should. The problem with that is that it's such a common condition that it's really difficult to, yeah, right. I mean, it's a, that, that's why this is tough. And, you know, every year, I mean, and I, we, 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 we submitted this to the Journal of Neurosurgery, and it looks like it probably will get accepted. I have a little trepidation about it because once you write a paper like this, then you then immediately... The plaintiff's attorneys come to you because, you know, they want to know, you know, well, is this patient that deteriorated? In fact, I've already seen one case of a patient that just, you know, came in with a colloid cyst to, the, um, to, her, to her primary care doctor in rural Illinois, and they're trying to, and, they, and then she deteriorated in about 10 hours, and they're trying to tag this guy because uh, this once-in-a-lifetime case that he's seen. Mm-hmm. Of a colloid cyst uh, died, and um, it's 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 a scary condition, but I think most of the patients do okay. But yeah. So it sounds like you favor a more conservative approach, obviously. In general, yeah. but it's, unless it's a unless it looks like a bad one, and then we sure. do, do it. Sure. But in general, most players may be that conservative patient. But then I thought I saw somewhere that you kind of thought there was about three percent. Counsel them and say, "This three percent death rate could totally lead to an asymptomatic patient. I'm going to have surgery, not by year, right? We, and, but, but no patient. That's a very good point, and I should have made this. No patient, except for that patient that we had lost to follow up, um, died. And in other words, that there were some patients that deteriorated about eight percent, but we managed them all." within about, you know, 12 hours, and it turned out okay. In other words, um, they can deteriorate, but if they, n- none of them deteriorated suddenly and died suddenly, you know. So there's two ways to look at that. You need, you need to say, well, you know, if there's a 10% chance I might get worse, then let's take it out. Other people would look at that same situation and say, Hey, ninety percent chance I'm going to be okay. Maybe if it gets worse, I'll come to the hospital. I mean, that's that's so it's not settled by this, but it, it's it's a problem. So the the balancing act is, you know, why not take them all out um, and you know save yourself the worry of progression and perhaps missing a patient. And there could be other centers that don't get to follow their patients. So closely as you. Yeah. So so you have to look at the flip side, which is yeah. a expense, obviously. Yeah. Um, but what are the downsides of taking an approach where you just operate on everybody? So have you looked at, in this case, neuropsychological impact? Because that's I think the, the major thing: you know, seizures and other types of complications of treating them all, and you know, let's put the cost factor on the side for now. Yeah. Yeah. The, the um, you know, in the Barrow study and, and our compilation of our results, we have a couple of patients who will have had seizures related to the inner hemispheric approach, I think. We had one, we've had a couple of problems. We've had patients who had problems with veins in the inner hemispheric approach, cortical veins. Um, you know, uh, I, I, we, we have not had as many complications with the endoscopic group in terms of seizures or any other ma- major thing. So I, I, we, we haven't, we, I can't answer the question yet because we don't have a big enough series yet, but we're, but we're interested in doing it. I think this is something that really cries out for a multi-institutional study um, to really answer the questions that you just posed and the others have posed about how to manage these things. So, I have a question I ask, what, what do you 
What does the flare signal mean? Why is it that those patients are more likely to progress? Some people have said, and we looked at this, that it indicates that hemorrhage might have occurred. There, there are some case reports indicating that if you have a hemorrhage into one of these lesions, it can be a cause of deterioration, sudden deterioration. When we looked at that with the SWI, you know, we, we did not find that. In other words, that was not an indicator. Um, you know, my the, the radiologist that I work with on this, in trying to determine what the significance of the flare is, basically, you know, what, what he tells me is that it really is just an indicator of either <coughs> mostly high protein. And so something about the protein content seems to be important with that in this context. Um, and I, so I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know why the flare seems to be so important. But as I said, it had been, in, in older studies, the T2 thing had been cited as an issue, and that's a similar finding. Um, but, the, but for us, the flare was a, a better discriminator. You know, it's, it's anecdotal, but there, there are several cases of patients with unruptured aneurysms that are discovered incidentally and there's high flare signal and then within yeah. a few days they rupture the lesion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an ominous, I don't know what it is, protein inflammation. <clears throat> it's, it, it kind of implies something. Could be inflammation. Kind of it implies yeah. that the brain's not happy. Yeah. That something is happening. I mean, it is anecdotal, but I, I mean, I've seen it and a lot of my colleagues have told me they've seen it. I see a patient in the office, completely asymptomatic <clears throat> aneurysm. Clear within a period of time, within the fundus scheme, around, play, around, around. Yeah, yeah. There's something. It's. I really paid a lot more attention to it. So. Yeah, getting back to the aneurysm part of the talk. Um, so, you know, you've identified these four groups. Have you guys thought pathogenetically uh, about the those four groups? You know, what they might say about how aneurysms arise and have a discriminator. Yeah, um, in the, what we're, we're, we're sort of trying to take it to the next level with this thousand patients that we're, that we're doing, is, and we're, what we're going to do is try to do some some uh, CFT on it to see if we can figure out how this relates to pathogenesis. Obviously, the the you know in the difference between the type two and the type four lesions. The hemodynamics are completely different because the jet into the into the fundus is going to be different, and that, so we're, we're hoping that CFD analysis can help us. But it's a lot of data, and, and I, I can't answer the question. Have you found any difference in the clinical characteristics of patients with the different aneurysms? That's a good question. Um, no, we haven't. Um, you'd think that maybe. Uh, the type fours would be more likely to be larger and present with seizures, for example, like, which, which they rarely do. Um, but we didn't we didn't find that. Yeah, John. Uh, one of the comments that she was, is that I actually something I learned when I was an intern. I actually attributed this to of all people, Tim Buckman, who was a dental surgeon at Washington. One of the very first things he taught me, one of the first, very first weeks was, whenever you encounter a surgical problem, make it into something you know. And that's that's essentially what we have to do when we define these clinical problems in our approaches to them. Because you always come at it with a set of a toolbox, and every new problem you see looks unique, the patient's unique, but you have to turn it into something you know. You have to characterize it. You have to have a logical approach to it. And you know, logical approaches may vary by surgeon vary over time and evolve, but if you don't have a logical approach to things, you never make progress in characterizing your experience, determining what worked, what didn't work, and making it better. So when we talk about surgical decision making, sometimes we can only get experience if you get a gestalt and just make the right idea, the right decision. It's more than that. And if you really approach it from a, I'm going to define things and turn these things into things, and not only in terms of characterizing it, but how I'm going to do it, it's just like in a surgical approach, it comes to stages, you learn how to do a craniotomy split the fissure, you know, how to approach the enemy, et cetera. So it becomes 
the, this, the hard part of the circuit is no longer the 99% of what you're to do because they can be broken. But then you can be broken up into these little pieces. At any given point, some little issue that arises is easy to figure out. So this is, you know, it, on the face of it, it's very simple, but it's something that requires a lot of this. Of course. Of course, none of that, what you just said, applies to spine surgery, right? <laughs> I'm, only, I'm just trying to jerk just right Just button. trying to jerk right <laughs> 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 The challenge is coding. Coding. Good. Thank you.